this Thanksgiving was surreal. It smelled like tank Thanksgiving. It tasted like Thanksgiving. But when you don't have to double, triple, or quadruple the green bean casserole recipe, it doesn't feel like Thanksgiving. When you don't have to put a leaf in the dining room table, or bring the card table up from the basement, or haul all the folding chairs in from the garage, something feels off. It left us longing for when we can go back, back to what we love, back to what we remember, back to how it was before. But one of the hardest questions that we have to ask when we're in exile is what happens if we can't go back? I remember going away from my freshman year of college and returning home for my first Thanksgiving. And in many ways, everything was the same. It was the same family, the same china, the same dishes, the same pumpkin pie. And yet, everything was different. The guests were different. Like I'd brought two of them home from college because they couldn't get all the way back to California. And the relationships were different. And people's maturity levels were different. And I was different. I'd been at college for two whole months and now I knew everything. <laughs> what I didn't know at the time is that after that Thanksgiving, I would never spend more than a couple consecutive weeks in that house again. And on a much larger scale, this is what happened to the people of ancient Israel. When the Babylonians invaded in about 586 BC, they were forced out of their ancestral homes and lands. They were dragged hundreds of miles away to start their lives over in a new culture, with a new language, and a new government that they didn't vote for, in a place that they didn't know. The challenge they faced is learning what it's like to live in exile. To have the trappings of normalcy, but to have this very real sense that we're not truly home. In the biblical story, many of the people who were born in Jerusalem would die in Babylon. And no one who was born in Babylon remembers this place that their ancestors called home. The book of Ezra tells us that after 70 years of exile, a group of Jews returned to Jerusalem. And they gathered to celebrate the beginning of the reconstruction of the temple. The temple was the center of all of civic and cultural and spiritual life for the Israelites. And many of them who had been there before remembered the glorious temple that Solomon built. But when the Babylonians invaded, that temple was raised to the ground. It was absolutely and totally destroyed. So when they came back to rebuild it, it said that they had this celebration to lay the new foundation. And they said that there was chaos in the crowd because some people were cheering. These are the people who were born in exile. They were getting a chance to reclaim a slice of their national and cultural identity. They were excited. But it also said that there was a group of people who were weeping out loud. And these people were the elders, people in their late 70s and in their mid-80s, people who had witnessed the original temple in all of its splendor. And when they saw the footprint for the new temple, they just broke down and cried because they knew that they would never get back what they lost. This is, this is the tension of being in exile. The moment that they were experienced failed to match the memory of what once was. Maybe this is why the author Thomas Wolfe said, you can never go home again. And he's right. It's kind of like that old proverb that you never step in the same river twice. As we age and grow and mature, as we lose the people that we love, physically and emotionally, we can never exactly return to the same place that we left. But Wolf is also wrong because spiritually, God promises a place called home for every single person who calls him king. And right now we're living in exile, a faraway land, a place where our expectations don't match our current reality. And one of the first followers of Jesus, a guy by the name of Simon Peter, wrote a letter to his friends in exile. And in it we find eight challenging steps for how to live as strangers in this world that we are temporarily calling home. Peter writes this, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles, as people who are living here but don't ultimately belong here, to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day that he visits us. It's the first step in living in exile is to live good. I know grammatically it's supposed to be live well, but the verse says live good lives. For some, the temptation of exile is to run out of discomfort. 
When Craig kicked this series off, he talked about this tension that many of us as followers of Jesus are experiencing when we are living as a convictional minority in this land. And some of us are like, I don't, I don't know what it's like to be on the other side of the majority and our temptation is, is to run, to flee, to find a place where we can kind of carve out our own kind of turf or terrain for us to live lives the way that we would want to, the way that we would choose to. But Peter says, don't fight the culture, rise above it. Instead of fighting people, fight your own twisted desires. Fight your own desire towards temptation to live in a way that is counter to what God has for you. If I spent as much time fixing me as I tried to fix the people around me, I think that I would be better and our relationships would be better. But I don't want to do that. I want to devote all of my energy to yelling at other people. And that, that has served me not well. There's a, there's a principle in recovery for those of, uh, th- those of us who have done it. And step nine talks about making amends, taking responsibility for the wrong that I have inflicted in my own life and the lives of others. And I was doing a step study in Celebrate Recovery, and my sponsor, a guy, an amazing guy by the name of Bill, said, he goes, Steve, you spend so much time yelling at what your neighbors are doing across the street that you haven't noticed that there's a huge mess of litter on your own front yard. He goes, Steve, all you can do is clean up your metaphorical side of the street. And that's what Peter is saying. Peter is saying, like, you can't control them. You cannot fix them. You don't have any leverage over their lives. But what you can do is you cannot fight them. You can fight the, your, the own worst version of yourself. And he goes, and if you focus on cleaning up your life, putting your heart in order, getting your brain wrapped around who Jesus is and what he wants, then you will view everything that is happening over there differently. He goes, I want you to live your life in such a way that the pagans, the people who hate, despise, and reject you and everything that they believe in, when they're done watching your life, they're like, I respect that. I admire that, and I want that. He goes, you want to live your life in such a way that even your enemies will bow their knee and praise Jesus on the day that he arrives. And then I want to ask us, like, how are we doing there? Are are we collectively living our lives in such a way that even those who oppose us say, I want what they want. I don't necessarily understand what they believe, but I respect that. And if if God were to stand before me, I would honor him because of the example that they have lived. How are we doing there? Are our actions prompting our adversaries to glorify God? Because if the answer is no, it's time for a tweak. It's time for a course correction. That's the first step. To live good. Verse 13, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake. I want you to remember that. For the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and commend those who do right. So the first step to living in this world as a stranger is to live good. The second step is to submit ourselves to every human authority. Now, I don't know about you. But this is one of those verses that I particularly don't like. Like, Anybody else have verses in the Bible you're like, if I could just scratch that one out, that would be great. That would work out well for me. There's a rumor that Thomas Jefferson cut, literally took a pair of scissors to his Bible and cut out all of the verses that he didn't like. This is one, this is one that I, I'll, just, I'll, I'll go first. I struggle with this one. Why? Because we live in a country that in, invented phrases like, don't tread on me. Or live free or die. And like when I was growing up on the playground, what, what, kind of, what were the lines that I overheard every day was, it's a free country. You can't tell me what to do. You're not the boss of me. I'll do what I want. Anybody else ever heard any of these? Yes. We say these all the time. Why? Because we live in America, right? Like that's what, that's what we're defined by. This fierce streak for independence, autonomy, a whole 200 years of history that says you can't tell me what to do. And in many ways, that has served us well. We have freedom of religion and freedom of speech and freedom of democracy in this country that many people around the world would envy. And yet, when we take that mentality and we take this verse, we have a problem marrying them together. It says when we're learning to live as strangers, we choose to submit ourselves to every human authority. Why? For the Lord's sake. Apparently, according to Peter, submitting to human authority is an act of worship. Unless that human authority asks me to do something unbiblical, immoral, or unethical. And I like to spend a lot of time focusing on the loophole. Like, well, what would happen if the government told me to do something that Jesus says that I can't do? In context... 
What were, the, what were some of the emperors in Rome asking people to do? They were asking them to worship the emperor as God instead of Jesus. And that was the one line that the early church would not cross. And many of them gave their lives because they would not deny their allegiance to Jesus. And I know sometimes we think that there's pressure against what we believe in this country. And I, I don't deny that the landscape is different now than where it used to be. But I've had this amazing privilege of being able to tour the world. And I've met people who have friends who were attempted to be assassinated by their family members for what they believed. I have friends who had family members who literally hand wrote copies of the Bible on pieces of paper because they were not allowed to own them. And they worshipped in like forests in Ukraine outside of Kiev because it was forbidden for them to worship in public. Guess what? No matter how much pressure you and I experience this year, it is nothing compared to what many people experience around the world on a regular basis. So a lot of us, we like to go to the nuclear option, like, well, what if the government asked me to do this? Well, we can talk about that when we get there, but the truth is the government hasn't asked us to do that yet. There's no indication that they're going to ask us to do that anytime soon. So let's, let's cross that bridge when we get there. But Peter says, submit to emperors and to governors unless they command you to sin. And even then, submit to the judge. If you disobey them and they give you a consequence, you have to roll with that. Daniel did it. Shadrach did it. Jesus did it. Stephen did it. Paul did it. Peter did it. And we are to do so as well. Yesterday, I had a brutal reminder, like an up-close example of what it's like to submit to another human authority. Her oldest daughter, Grace, had her road test to get her driver's license yesterday. And um, every, if you're a parent who's done this, you know that it's an act of faith and surrender to participate in any portion of this pro process. And when I, was, when I was growing up, you went to the Secretary of State to do it, but now they've got like private contractors that will do it. So like we drive to this parking lot in Zealand and we meet Jackie. Jackie is this sweet, amazing, lovely woman. Good news, Grace passes the parking portion, which means that she gets to graduate to the road test. And we get ready for the road test and Jackie goes, okay, Grace, you're going to drive. I'm going to ride shotgun. And dad, you're going to sit in the back and not talk. It's like, wait a second. Like, this is my car. I bought it. And this is my daughter. I raised her. You are a guest in this process. You don't get to tell me what to do. And then I realized I could say that, and then I would be driving my daughter around until the day I die. So there's this trade-off here, right, where I can submit to her authority or not. But if I do, I, my lip is bleeding in the back seat because I want to tell Jackie a couple things she could do better. I don't want to tell Grace all the things that she's missing. She passed, for those of you who are curious, so you can pray for us again, right? What did, what did, what did I learn? I learned I don't like to submit, but sometimes God institutes authority for my well-being even if I don't see it at the time. So we talk more about that in a little bit when we get to this other footnote on emperors. But how are we doing is submitting to human authorities? Not because we like it, not because we feel good about it, but we do it, what does Peter say? We do it for the Lord's sake. We give God honor. We give God praise when we respect the people that he is either actively or passively allowed to be a part of the chain of command in this democracy. First step, live good. Second step, submit yourselves. Third step, respect everyone. Verse 15, for it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God and honor the emperor. Let's start with the first kind of command there. Show proper respect to everyone. Respect everyone. Peter says strangers counter the disrespect of other people by doing good. He says by doing good you can silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Has anybody had any encounters, don't raise your hand, with foolish or ignorant people online this year? Don't raise your hand. Anybody, ha anybody had any of that? How many of you have noticed that by countering rhetoric with more angry, better rhetoric, you change everybody's minds in an instant? Has that worked out well for us? No. But, but a lot of times, like, we're like, but this time it's going to work. I have a better argument. And, like, we type, and then they say something back, and then we get mad, and then we have to have the last word, and then we can't get any sleep because we're stressed out about it. Like, that sounds like a really healthy, godly way to live our lives, does it not? 
What does he say? He goes, you want to sh shut up foolish, ignorant talk? Then respond to it by living a good, blame-free life. That's how you win other people over, not break them down. It is God's will to counter hostility by doing good. We counter critique with compliment. I remember seeing an athlete once, uh, I think it was a pro NFL quarterback, he got sacked, and the, the defensive end was just standing over him like jawing, like just, just smack talking, trying to bait him, trying to get inside his head. The quarterback popped up, he's like, hey, nice hit, man, and he walked away. Defenders don't know what to do with that. Because part of the mind game is just trying to see if I can poke you, poke you, poke you, poke you, and, get, and if I get you to point back, guess what? I win. Because I'm in your head now. And Peter says, don't play those games. That's a waste of time and spiritual and mental energy. Rise above. If you show proper respect to everyone, even if they have not earned it or deserved it, there will be a return on that investment. How are we doing showing proper respect? Are we doing it well with family members? Are we doing it well with neighbors, digital strangers, colleagues? If the answer is yes, then just keep rocking that. If it's not, consider how you might need to tweak that one particular part of your exile journey. Respect everyone, then love the family of believers. Peter says that sometimes we're so busy fighting culture wars that we forget to love people who are hurting. Sometimes living in exile strips our sense of being able to act. It strips our sense of personal agency. We start to feel like victims. We feel like we're not in control. We can't shape our environment to meet our needs or tailor it for our preferences. And when we get so worked up about what's not working for us, we, we have blinders on. And we can't see what's happening in other people's lives. And sometimes I forget that in the midst of my hurting, there are people who are right next to me who are hurting, but I can't see them because I'm so focused on me. And Peter says, I want you to love the family of believers. And if our pain or our circumstances are blinding us to the needs of others around us, we need to ask God to break those off, to like just kind of rip those scales off of our eyes and allow us to see with our full peripheral vision. So some of you know that I'm in between jobs right now, and so there's kind of like a stress factor that comes with that, trying to figure out what we're going to do next. And then last week, Kelly had a slip and fall, and she broke her shoulder, so that was going on. And like I had this pity party moment where I wanted to be like, ah, the world isn't working out for us. And then I realized that we had dear friends on the other side of the state who, whose son was in the ICU, and other people locally who have gone through just absolute brutal, heartbreaking experiences as parents, and us needing to recalibrate and say, God, don't let me be so blinded by the circumstances in my life that I cannot show love to other people who are in crisis, who are in need, who are only a phone call, a text, or, or a walk away from me. God is opening the doors for us to encourage, pray for, reach out, and support people who are in crisis. But if we're so focused on our own universe, we're going to miss out on those opportunities. So how are we doing when it comes to loving the family of believers? Have you ever drive through a new town and you realize that there are a couple churches that are way too close to each other for it to make sense for the geography? I'm not talking about this town. I'm talking about other towns. When we lived in the Detroit area, there was a church called um, Mount Moriah Baptist Church. And then a couple blocks away there was Second Mount Moriah Baptist Church. And then right around the corner was Greater Mount Moriah Baptist Church. And we're like, wait a second, something weird happened with these guys. Because they all used to be together, but now they're apart. And a lot of times people say, well, the reason that denominations get started is because people are committed to doctrinal purity. They're trying to guard against heresy or blasphemy or unorthodoxy. And I don't deny that that, that is the intent of that. But I think at the end of the day, a lot of churches split because people don't like to get along with each other. The reason the church is split, the reason that some whole entire denominations get started isn't because of our commitment to truth, it's because of our refusal to love. And my, my great fear is that a generation from now or two generations from now, our grandkids are going to say like, why are there four churches on this spot because of two? And we'll be like, well, back in 2020, there was this thing called masks and it stressed people out and churches split over it. And we got to say, is that, what Je is, is that what Jesus wants for us? Like, like, are some of the issues that are ripping relationships and entire churches apart, are, are those really the hills that we want to die on? Or are we going to surrender our personal agenda for a half a second and walk in the way of love? Because that is a non-negotiable for those of us who claim to follow Jesus. 
You, you, want, you want to live well as an exile? Live, live good. Submit yourselves to human authority. Respect everyone. Love the family of believers. And then fear God. This, the word fear in this context means to put something in its proper place. When we show that we fear God, we submit to Christ's wisdom and power. But if we're afraid of the future, afraid of the government, or afraid of the media, or afraid of any one of a hundred other things, we're guilty of idolatry because we're giving something power over us that should only ever belong to God. Proverbs chapter 1 verse 7 says, The fear of the Lord, the appreciation of who God is, that is the beginning of wisdom. My friend Stuart Cohen says, what we think and feel determines what we say and do. So in my mind, if I'm ever doing or saying something that is foolish, reckless, unkind, or irresponsible, I have to trace it back to say, what was the thought or the feeling that prompted me to do that? And more often than not, a wrong view of who God is and a wrong view of who God says I am results in behaviors that don't look anything like Jesus. And the gospel tells me that when I, when I identify that gap between what I'm doing and what Jesus does, I have to say, like, Lord, I missed it. Will you give me a clearer picture of who you are? Will you allow me to fear you, respect you, honor you in a new, right, and appropriate way so that I don't get things twisted? So if number four is to love the family of believers, number five is to fear God. How are we, how are we doing there? Then he says, honor the emperor. Some of us are like, wait, didn't we already cover this when we talked about submitting to every human authority? If you're a parent, you know that there is a difference between watching your child submit to your authority and watching a child honor your authority. So if you've ever had two children fight and you said to like one of them, like, hey, go tell your brother I'm sorry. And they're like, I'm sorry, but you know they didn't mean it because of like the look was on their face when they said it. You know that they were submitting, but they were not honoring. And it's possible for us to submit to the will of the emperor and not honor the emperor. Now, this is, this is where things get a little bit tricky. Because some of us say, like, like we already talked about, well, what happens if they ask me to do something that, that I don't feel is right? Well, guess what the good news of living in a democracy is? We have a recourse. When the Apostle Paul didn't like a judicial decision that he got at a lower court, what did he do? He appealed to a higher court. And we saw this perfectly at work in our country this last week. The governor of New York was trying to influence mask mandates on houses of worship. The two groups that were affected, Catholic groups and Jewish groups, appealed to the state government. They were denied. They appealed to the Supreme Court, and they won their case. Is it possible to go through the proper protocols to resist a decision that we don't like and honor the person that we disagree with every step along the way? The answer is yes. So as believers, we can advocate for our cause through the existing channels that we have in this beautiful democracy that is often sometimes flawed but still gives us multiple channels of redress. If we don't like how things are going in the executive, we get a chance to vote differently the next time around. If we don't like things are going in the legislature, we can make our voice heard. If we don't like how things are going in the Supreme Court, or at the court level, we can appeal. So we have all of this leverage that the early church didn't have. When he said, honor the emperor, the stakes were a whole lot higher for them than it was for us. Have you ever done a, like just a cursory reading of how screwed up some of the emperors of Rome were back in the day? Like Caligula was an emperor of Rome shortly after Jesus died and rose again. If you don't know the history on Caligula, like brother had issues. Like there's a rumor that he tried to get his horse appointed as one of his cabinet members, all right? So he wasn't seeing straight exactly. There's another rumor that Caligula didn't like the fact that they ran out of prisoners to kill in the gladiator arena. So he just took a chunk of the audience and threw them out onto the floor and watched them die. That is a person who should not be in power, and yet he was. See, we, even though we feel like we're a statistical minority in this country, we're still like, what, 50, 60 million strong as, like a, as, a, as, a, as a Christian vote, as, a, as an evangelical vote, as it were. In the, the early church, they had zero leverage at all. They couldn't, when they got stuck, when they got at odds with the emperor, when Nero was trying to kill Christians, some, some historical tales say that he would actually take followers of Jesus and light them on fire to illuminate his garden parties. That's horrific. That's abuse at a whole nother level. But the early church, what, what recourse did they have? What leverage did they have? Guess what? They couldn't vote because they, it was an empire and there were no votes. They couldn't lawyer up and they didn't have a war chest. So guess what they had to do? They had to lean on Jesus for their faith, for their courage, and for their peace. 
And I believe that one of the great challenges that we're facing right now is that we as a country have stockpiled so many resources, so many advocacy, advocacy groups, so many lobby options to advocate our cause, that if we're not careful, we might get deceived into thinking that we don't need Jesus to be the people that he's called us to be. And I believe that when, when he, this, the early church was instructed to honor the emperor, it's saying, you don't have to sign off on everything that he does. You don't have to agree. You, you, you can be mortified by the way that he is leaning, but I want you to honor the person and the office as a follower of Jesus. Why? Because Peter doesn't want anyone to choke on his politics. If they resist anything, he wants them to resist the message of Jesus. To make sure that the only excuse people have to persecute you is your allegiance to your Savior. Now we don't know exactly how Peter's story ends. Church history tells us that he was martyred, that he was actually crucified upside down because he didn't deem himself worthy to die in the same manner as his Lord. But we do know that his contemporary, the Apostle Paul, through his efforts to respect the emperor, he never badmouthed the emperor, allowed him to make it all the way to Rome, the seat of power. He leveraged the legal system as it existed as a vehicle to proclaim Christ in the highest halls of power. So how are we doing when it comes to honoring our national leaders, both current and future? And doing it out of allegiance and loyalty, first and foremost, to Jesus Christ. Verse 18 says, Slaves, in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters, not only those who are good and considerate, but also those who are harsh. For it's commendable if somebody bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. Step seven to living as a stranger is to endure suffering. Nobody enjoys suffering, but it's a consequence of living in a broken world. Every single one of us are going to face heartache, disease, injustice, death, financial hardship. But it's in the crucible of suffering that our faith is truly tested. It's at the crossroads of suffering that we ask two important questions. The first one is, do I believe in the cross of Jesus Christ? Because the cross teaches us that God redeems suffering for our good and for his glory. Jesus didn't want to suffer. He begged the Father, please take this cup from me. But at the end of the day, he said, God, let your will be done and not mine. And then, then there's this question. Do I believe in the resurrection? Do I believe that God defeated death? once and for all? And do I believe that we will rise again? See, when my, when my dad was physically slipping away from us about a year and a half ago, we were begging, we were begging God to heal him, to restore him, to save him. And when it became clear that that wasn't going to happen, every single one of us who were gathered around his bed had to ask this question, do we believe that the resurrection is true? Because if it's not, there's nothing for us to pin our hopes on. It all ends here. But if it is, we have something to hang on to. And I, I thank God that my dad was able to look us in the eye and say, I've had a good run. And I believe that I'm going home to meet my heavenly father. And we're going to be reunited again. And that's a, that, is a, that hope is an anchor that keeps us from being swept away by the storms of grief or fear or pain. Peter says, how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, that's commendable. That's praiseworthy before God. To this you were called. Because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. Peter is saying, like, even if, even if the world tries to hurt your body, Jesus Christ is the overseer and defender of your soul. So how, do, how are we doing when it comes to enduring suffering? Are we committed to fighting? Are we committed to fleeing? Are we committed to the center path, which is remaining as a person of faithful witness? So 
We have all these steps that we can take. But the last one is this. Remember that you are exiles. The reason that you can endure whatever comes down your path is because you know at your core that this earth, as you see it, is not your final destination. The book of Genesis tells the story of a young man named Joseph. When Joseph was 17 years old. His other brothers hated him so much, they threw him in a pit. Some of them actually wanted to execute him. But some said, hey, we can make some money off of this deal. So they sold him to some traveling slave traders. And he eventually made his home in Egypt. And through a long, crazy series of events, he rises to the power of number two in command of one of the most influential countries of his day. And at the end of his life, he says this to his brothers, I'm about to die, but God will surely come to your aid and take you out of this land, Egypt, to the land he promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the promised land. And Joseph made the Israelites swear an oath and said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones up from this place. He's like, I'm going to make it home, even if I'm not alive, but you're going to take a piece of me there. So Joseph died at the age of 110. He lived 17 years in the promised land and 93 in exile. But that whole time he was in exile, every single one of those 93 years, he's like, this is not my home. This is not my home. This is not my home. I can serve well. I can stare down suffering. I can honor God. I can fear a pagan boss, the Pharaoh of all of Egypt, because I know that God is weaving a broader tapestry than what I can see and understand. The book of Hebrews says, By faith, Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions concerning the burial of his bones. And then the writer of Hebrews talks about other people who had lived with a similar kind of faith in their own version of exile. It said, all of these were commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. Since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. The writer of Hebrews is saying, we don't have to love the world that we're in. We don't deny it, we don't reject it, we engage it, but we do so with an eye towards eternity knowing that God is going to resolve this either on this side of eternity or on the other. But in the end, the kingdom will always win over the empire. Hebrews 11 finally says, All these people were still living by faith when they died. They didn't receive the things that they promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they'd been thinking of the country that they left, they would have had an opportunity to return. But instead they were longing for a better country. A heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. I think sometimes when we have this, this fracture between what we think should be and what is, a lot of us, we want to go into fix-it mode and say, well, look, how, do I, how do I build a bridge from what I, I want to where we are? And God says, there are steps that you can take, but know that it, won't be it might not be fully realized in your lifetime. It doesn't mean that I don't love you. It doesn't mean that I'm not in control. It means that I'm doing something that you cannot yet fully comprehend. But I want you to know that when you trust me, when you trust me, you'll receive something better than if you didn't. And there's this, there's this great line in a hymn many of us know that says, Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Tis grace that brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. God is going to lead us to a home that we haven't seen, but when we get there, everything's going to feel exactly as it should be. Let's pray together. Father God, I thank you that you are our Father and you want good for us. And you also want to see yourself glorified and you want to see people who aren't yet part of your family enveloped into it. And so God, for those of us, myself included, who struggle with this whole concept of being a stranger, an alien, an exile in the current space that we're in, God, give us grace and a burn to live such good lives that other people are intrigued by it and want to know what it is to follow you and know you and be with us. God, give us the capacity to submit, to respect, to love, to honor, and to remember what you say is true. 
Lord, in the midst of all that is going on in the world that we can't control, remind us to take responsibility for only that which you have put on our plate. Allow us to own it. And rather than me, Lord, I'll speak only for myself, wasting a ton of energy trying to make other people as I would have them be. Give me the grace to bend it to your will as you ask me to be the person that you died in order for me to become. Allow us to fix our feet on your promises and our gaze towards Christ and Christ alone. We pray these things in Jesus' name.